<clears throat> CFR Network, CFR yeah. News, Shalom Balance Paradise, good day, good night to all. Miha, wassalam, bonjour, hola, all of the universal greetings. Back, diligently working hard in the lab, special guest with me, uh, best-selling author, film producer, very intelligent individual I have with me today, the one and only Billy Carson. Welcome to the broadcast, sir. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. Thanks for taking to carving out some time in your busy schedule uh, to have this uh, sit down and conversation with me. Very brief introduction for myself. So please flesh out your capabilities, sir, to the listeners and the citizens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a two time best selling author of two books. One is Compendium of the Emerald Tablets. And the other book is Woke Doesn't Mean Broke. The first book talks about ancient civilizations and uh, really the history of things that happened right after the massive great flood. And then uh, the second book is a book about spirituality and financial literacy and how the two actually go hand in hand and are not separate. And it guides people to understand a lot of the financial aspects of this matrix that we're in so they can create and build, work on building a legacy you know, for themselves in the future. I'm also a TV producer, uh, a writer for shows and documentaries, and I'm the owner of Forbidden Knowledge TV with number four, Forbidden Knowledge TV, which is a streaming TV platform on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iOS, and Google Play, and doing very well right now on those app stores, and just here to bring more consciousness to the planet and try to expand understanding to the world. Excellent. Ex excite thoughts and um, allow people and enable people to ultimately make um, those critical decisions and critical thinking um, yes. and add that more into their day to day routine and, and, and lifestyle. I love it. Yeah. Can you ex expand a bit more into that, um, the channel that you've got? What kind of content are you putting out on that? Yeah, sure. So, Forbidden Knowledge TV is something that I came up with actually about seven years ago. And this was before streaming platforms were huge and the streaming fees back then, Netflix didn't even exist yet. Uh, and I had a concept to do what look, you know, what is like a conscious Netflix before Netflix existed. And um, I bought the domain name, people can see the age of the domain name itself when .tv first came out. But back then the streaming fees were so high and, and crazy. I think I had like 50 videos up and it was costing me well over 1,800 a month for, for bandwidth. So I paused it temporarily, and then I was a little bit too ahead of myself when all the when Netflix and Amazon Prime Video and all these streaming platforms came out. I knew that would that would that competitiveness would drop the cost of streaming, and sure enough, it did. So I jumped back in a year and a half ago, and built Forbidden Knowledge TV. It's like the conscious Netflix, basically. We've got uh, documentaries, workshops, lectures, conscious TV shows, music, conscious music, conscious music videos yoga, cooking classes, fitness classes. I mean, you name it, all on this streaming platform. It looks just like Netflix and Amazon Prime, except the content is mostly centered around consciousness and education and learning. Excellent. And, and trustfully, there's going to be an element of financial lit literacy in that as well. Oh, absolutely. We have some financial stuff up there. We have real estate. We have uh, uh, different uh, mortgage lenders talking about different ways you can get alternative financing. I've got a workshop on there coming up. Called, I have one up there now for financial literacy, and I have another one coming up in about a month uh, called the Woke Don't Mean Broke Financial Literacy uh, Workshop. And it, these are all free. You know, so once you subscribe to the TV network, which is only seven bucks a month, you get access to thousands of lectures, workshops, teachings, esoteric wisdom, ancient civilizations, all these things uh, for seven bucks a month. Not a bad price at all, sir. Not a bad price at all. I'll make sure um, I put links below in the description so Thank we you. can uh, get some more traffic over there and, you know, expose uh, mm -hmm. the listeners and the siblings to a, a little bit more different knowledge, should we say. Yeah, right. Hey, I appreciate it. Thank you. Some alternative. It's all about alternative views so people can make an informed decision themselves rather than allowing the powers that should have never have been to dictate and mold yeah. society as it is today. So this is this is what it's all about, sir. This is what it's all about. Um, let's jump in the DeLorean. We throw Marty and Duck out, and we're going back in time. Mm -hmm. um, where, whereabouts in the wilderness of North America were we born and raised? 
Yeah. <laughs> well, I was born in Queens, which is in New York City. Uh, so I was Queens General Hospital. This is back in 1971. And um, we lived in Cambria Heights, Queens, for quite some time until I was seven. Now, Cambria Heights is a, was a pretty decent area that, as I can remember from being a kid, that's a little suburb area. Uh, and, uh, you know, for me, it was, uh, it was a good, it was a good start. Look, it seemed like I got off to a great start, but my parents were having some issues, uh, with, uh, the area, my father in particular, unfortunately he was, uh, you know, alcoholic and he was a drug addict. And so my mom and, uh, convinced him to move to Florida and uh, specifically to Miami. <laughs> so I don't know why they thought that would be a better move. But we moved right into the den, into the into a crazy part of the world. <laughs> uh, you know, the rise of the cocaine cowboys. And yeah. All this, well, you boat you, lift and all this stuff was going on. You had one good trade off. At least you had better weather down in Miami rather than in Queens. <laughs> we, we had better weather. We could, you know, I can go outside more, which was, you know, that was the trade off. <laughs> but that's how I got to Miami. So they decided to move and try to have a, a fresh start, so to speak. We moved right into a hardcore ghetto, and uh, we moved into a place called. Op- Walaka. Bro, we, we, I yeah. know about that place. You know about that place? Listen, man, it's the hardcore place, man. Still to this day, it's hardcore. Indeed, you know? sibling. That is, they're wild out there, sibling, man. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, really wild. And we were there, and we were in the center of the Bermuda Triangle. They had this triangle built around the city at that time, a steel fence to keep the crime in. <laughs> wow. Uh, but, you know, that's how I got to Florida. Yeah. So, a youngster, a young age, um, were we in parents wise influence? Was we in, into sort of a, a more spiritual sort of outlook, or was we brought up in a sort of monotheistic sort of Abrahamic sort of one of those sort of faiths? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, my family always seemed a little confused to me <laughs> because, <laughs> in one aspect, they would say prayers and things like that, and my dad would make me quote all these Bible scriptures and learn all these verses from the Bible, and he would have me, you know quoting the 23rd Psalm to his, his drunkard buddies and stuff like that. And then on the other hand, we had a lot of aspects of spirituality in our family where, uh, you know, I would see family members referencing, you know, ancient rituals and African rituals and spirituality and, and saints and, and statuettes that they would present offerings to and all this stuff. And I was like confused, like, what are you guys into? Is it this or is it that? Oh. So it was kind of this mix. You know, but nobody was forced to go to church. Nobody really went to church, actually. I don't even remember a day where we said, okay, everybody get dressed, we have to go to church now. Mm. So it sounds like there was elements of sort of what, Santeri and that kind of stuff mixed in. Yes. It's a mixture of the island, you know, uh, spirituals like Santeri and other things, along with, uh, you know, Christianity. It was a smorgasbord of... Yeah. Of course, especially being down in Miami as well. I mean, you've yeah. got the, the Haitian influence, you've got other Caribbean influences right. as well, the African influence, um, mm-hmm. yeah. a bit of Latin as well there. So mm-hmm. yeah. interesting. Okay. So, you know, one part of my, my mother's side of the family is Puerto Rican and, and from the Virgin Islands, you know, and, and my dad's side was Blackfoot Indian. So it's kind of a, a weird mix. Definite. So Af- Afro-Puerto Rican and, and uh, Indigenous American. Right. So can you go back to, to the specific tribe? Is it Iroquois or? It would have been Iroquois, yeah. Wow. We, we, it's, it's interesting that, you know, thousands of miles separate, you know, original people. But when we go back <laughs> and we go mm-hmm. back and we look at the roots and, yeah. you know, we, we, we're just different tribes, man. <laughs> yeah, so that's all it is. A whole bunch of different tribes. Yeah, for real. And now we've got nationhoods attached to that. And it's just totally separated the whole familiar yeah. But, yeah. you know, slowly but surely, we're chipping away. We're breaking the yeah. barriers down. Mm-hmm. Um, we're creating that, that sense of, a, of a, a, a global community. Yeah. Rather well, the internet than... has helped with that, thankfully. Say that again, sorry? The, the internet has helped with that ability oh. for us to create a global community. It's been breaking down a lot of invisible walls. Tremendously. I mean, look what, what we're doing at the moment. We're, we're utilizing <laughs> technology for a better cause rather than using it to go on Twitter and be an anonymous sort of hater or make crazy right. videos about people and stuff. It's it's an interesting world. I mean, 
especially in the Gregorian year of 2022, it seems more and more apparent that hate mm -hmm. is the new love. Yeah, I know. It really is sad in some cases, especially the way that some people have uh, tried to uh, push, put themselves into the quote unquote conscious community on the premise of pushing consciousness, but actually are doing the opposite by attacking spiritual leaders, by attacking people that are in the community versus you know, uh, finding ways to provide solutions and finding ways to, to uh, maneuver around these uh, you know, these conscious prisons that they put us under and these physical prisons, uh, they spent more time doing a lot of more of the same divide and conquer tactics. And it's like the human beings in some cases are the prisoners and the prison guards. <laughs> so I don't know how to let themselves free. Indeed, it's, it's, it's almost like Stockholm Syndrome where we're, we've, we've learned so much from, <clears throat> pardon self, from the yeah. oppressor that mm -hmm. <clears throat> we're mimicking the behavior. So, you know, I mean, in life, we all have different paths and sometimes we're, we're, we're so much on the left path being so worldly and stuff and we get into crime and we may go to prison and stuff. But there comes a, a time in some people's life, especially in a male's life, let's look at it in that respect, we throw away the boy stuff, the childish stuff, yeah. and we become a man and we realize, wait a minute, the world is a big place. Mm -hmm. I have a place in this world. What's my, what's my mark going to be within this world? Mm -hmm. And what kind of legacy and dynasty can I bring forth? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's it, man. That's where the mind needs to be going. How can I build a legacy? How can I leave something behind for the future generations that's going to inspire and also give them the ability to maybe have a, a little bit of a footstool that they can step on versus starting from zero every single time. Exactly. That, that it's incumbent on us now in so much importantly in, in this sort of time and era that we're in where we've got cryptocurrency access to and all mm -hmm. sorts of ways to generate multiple different revenue streams. It's, it's this time now we need to be as smart as possible, make the, the, the intelligent investments create right. the new whatever it's going to be if you have that 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 creativity and that creative spark should we say and mm -hmm. then 10 years 20 years 30 years where you've got children they have you as you say that footstool to say yeah. i want to create this business okay i've got <clears throat> 150k ready and available okay that's a start mm -hmm. for me to get my foot on the ladder exactly that's exactly what it's all about People tend to think that I talk about financial literacy because I believe materialism is great. No, no. <laughs> I'm going to live now. I'm going to have my heaven on earth now. At the same time, I build for future, for generations, for legacy. Because if I know if I focus on building legacy, my abundance is guaranteed. That's just the side effect of building a legacy. And so, you know, they, they've mistaken the, uh, uh, you know, the concept. Uh, sometimes you're showing him to sell the moon and he points at the finger. You know, so you have to really, you know, you know reinstill these, these uh, things over and over again to people. No, it's about understanding that you don't have to be financially oppressed, suppressed. And as things change in the world in this really hectic scale, like, for example, what's going on in Russia is affecting global markets. People are just next to a lady who was complaining about she lost $70,000 in the market. Well, if you understand what it means when these things occur, then you can actually capitalize on them and keep your legacy growing, even in down times. You know, so these are the things I try to teach people. It's so, so important. It, it's mm -hmm. a very much a tumultuous time we're living in, but at the same time, looking at it, it's with the cup half full, as I always do. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. time. There's so yeah. much opportunity, so much opportunity. You just gotta yes. have the, 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 the courage, the gumption, the persistence. Yeah. Um, you know the consistency mm -hmm. to do it just step yeah. out it's a big wide world you just got to step out and do it yeah absolutely just got to take this step off that cliff and have to have faith in yourself mm -hmm. not in outside sources not in other people not in extra you know dimensional deities faith in yourself when you take that step and because it's only yourself that can save you well this the scripture says as you may know um faith without works is a death yeah. that's right <laughs> that's right and that's a fact you, you gotta put the work in man and it, it goes in i mean we, we have you know some listeners who are agnostics uh, atheists um most do believe in some sort of creative force but generally it, it it's about you doing the work 
you can't sit around thinking as you say of an external force or, or your friend coming to say yeah. you know what you know what steve here you go here's here's 50 quid i know you know you, you, you know you ain't got much money yet. no 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 if you haven't got much money you've got to go pick up some cans you've got to take yourself yeah. to some interviews you you know you've right. got to either, you know, you've got to do some yes you got to put that work in money is a energy exchange it's the side effect of an energy exchange i mean so uh if you want money to show up in your account you need to exchange energy in some way shape or form and that is the only way it's going to show up in your account there's no other way 100 percent, 100 percent. i mean going back to your my your time in miami i take it mm -hmm. you still a resident down in miami or have you moved back up to the uh to the tri-state well now yeah now i'm in uh i moved up to fort lauderdale northwest fort lauderdale as far north and west as you can go in Fort Lauderdale before you go into the next county. So I'm in Broward County still. Uh, but, uh, you know, when I was 16, I moved uh, just not too far away, uh, moved uh, to a brand new community in North Miami. And then from there, I moved out of Miami to Broward uh, about a year later. And then from there, I just kept moving a little bit, edge my way west and then and north, west and north, little by little <laughs> until I got to where I am now. Fort Lauderdale, beautiful place. I haven't been there since 92, I think. But yeah, oh, beautiful wow, place. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would. I wouldn't mind get, getting back to uh, the wilderness of North America, especially doing a bit more of a traveling down south rather than uh, the, the tri-state area. Okay. Um, yeah. Once we can get this um, crazy traveling situation sorted, I will be um, one of the first on the plane. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, man. You got to do it. So your journey. How did we? How did we? What was the spark that said? Mm -hmm. I want to start looking into, you know, our story and his story and making yeah. sense out of nonsense. Right. <laughs> yeah. It all started really um, in Miami, but the initial seeds of the, you know, the rooted seeds started before Miami. So in New York, I was reading at a very early age. And as I said, my father would make me quote scriptures and things like that to his friends at bars. You know, he'd have me in the bars as three year old sitting on top of the counter quoting the 23rd Psalm and all these things and, and all these things, he would ask me math questions and, and multiplication tables. And it, you know, I guess it would have done his friends or whatever, but through that, reading that the Bible and doing book reports on the Bible, you know, at those young ages, I started noticing discrepancies in the information. I started noticing contradictions. So I already had those seeds in my head, like this thing, there's something in here that just doesn't make any sense. And nobody can answer my questions about these things. But fast forward to New York, uh, fast forward to uh, moving to Florida from New York, and we're in Miami, I'm out in my backyard, uh, watching airplanes go over my my backyard, because we were close to the Opelika airport. And it was just a cool thing to do. No TV, there's no cell phones, people's pages, no Wi Fi, none of this cable TV didn't even exist. So you couldn't <laughs> watch cartoons all day, right? <laughs> old yeah, school, four, old school, super old school, four channels, the seventies, four channels on TV, that's it, you mm. could barely get those tuned in. And so I'm outside watching these airplanes go over and just observing them because it was weird that it would take them so long to clear the horizon in my backyard from point to point. But I knew that they were moving fast because you can you have to move fast to stay in the air. Uh, and then this one day, this object came across more oval, not round, but more oval shape. And it went across the horizon in seconds, not minutes. And that's when I was blown away. And I was like, what did I just see? And it came back then it stopped. But this time when it came back, it was lower. It was only about 300 meters maybe above me. What? And then it just went, and it was out the way that it came in originally. And it was like in a flash. I mean, literally in blink of an eye, it's gone. And I was like, what did I just see? I didn't have the word. I didn't have the vocabulary for aliens. I didn't have the vocabulary for flying saucer or UFOs. Didn't exist in my, in my paradigm. Didn't even know those words existed at that time. What I did know was it didn't have a cockpit. It didn't have uh, wings, a tail fin, you know, a fuselage. It was more of this glowing orb that was more elongated and oval shaped, like gleaming metal. And I said, what in the world was that? Nobody can ask me. And so I went to the library at school, Rainbow Park Elementary, and I got all the Encyclopedia Britannicas on aerospace. And I started studying aerospace. I was looking for, you know, what I saw. It, was, it intrigued me so much. And I was reading, uh, I was looking for, you know, Delta Wing and Swept Wing and Supersonic mm. Transport and and rocketry and, and all these different things. Even the early stages of anti-gravitics, which would really 
propelled by fans and jets, these one man things that that um, military soldiers would get and they would lift them off the ground yes. and they could maneuver it all around. All those things, this is in the 70s, in which these things have already been invented back in the 60s. But I still found nothing. I even looked into the SR-71. They even had a little bit of information on some of the experimental testing on that. I'm like, this isn't even close to what I saw. So that drove me into becoming kind of a quasi-aerospace historian. And I started studying deep, deep, deep into aerospace and rocketry and everything else, just on my own, just because it was a passion. And eventually, um, that led me into the modern era where I was working on a, you know, studying astrophysics took me into understanding some potential things that can happen in the future. Like mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an asteroid named Apophis, and there's a few other anomalies out there that could come into a collision with Earth. And I was hypothesizing, what if these things really do happen? What if we do have a collision and we can't stop it, we can't move it or shift its orbit? The best thing to do is have an underground shelter. So I started working on this underground shelter project back in around 2010. Uh, and so this project actually made it onto the History Channel. So it's a huge project. Is this private or government backed? Private, all private. Yeah, it's a $20 million project. And how I funded it was I funded it by creating a membership program and having applicants who wanted to be in the shelter with me. I built an underground community, hosts 360 people, uh, a very stringent application process and you buy your space for the future of you know needing to get in there in case yeah. there is a catastrophe and so i funded it with its own members and so i funded the whole project <laughs> wow you know? yeah yeah so 20 million dollar project um uh and so but during this process i had i can't even there's no other way to say it other than exactly what it was i had this a visitation some type of an encounter uh i was in my house one day after working on that project um, and I was just watching ESPN news updates, sports updates. And it was around nine o'clock PM. Wasn't, I wasn't tired. And the room turned this lavender color. The TV went zoom and just went down. I thought my kids were playing a joke on me. So I looked over my left corner to where my boys would be in that left corner upstairs. Nobody was there. Nobody was playing with me. Nobody, there was no, nobody there at all. Now the kids were in the house, but they weren't outside the room. And I was like, what is going on? When I turned around, I was originally going to go upstairs. So I turned around what looked like these two great alien beings were in my face. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, it, it took me a long time to even talk about this because it, it's just a, a situation where I didn't get any good. Nothing good came out of this whole situation. It ended up mm -hmm. causing a lot of turmoil in my household, as well as uh, one of my kids is still afraid to come to my house to this very day, one of my sons. But it looked like they had, their eyes were these almond, giant almond shaped eyes, but they didn't look like uh, biological eyes. It looked like they were of some type of covering on them. And I was sitting in a chair, much like I am now, a couch. So they were probably four, four and a half feet tall. So we're talking uh, about a classical lamb, lamb kind of description. Yeah, yeah, yes I am, yeah. Whoa. And they didn't communicate with me with any words telepathically that I can understand, but they, whatever they were doing was making my brain shake in my skull. Like literally my brain was shaking. I started screaming because of the pain. And even the sound from my scream wouldn't come out. You, you couldn't hear anything. You can, I can feel the air and the wind coming out, but I couldn't hear it. And um, within 30 seconds or, or less, it was over. They turned around and they kind of dangled away because they don't walk normal and they left. That room, the colors came back, the, the light, the lavender color went away, the TV came back. I went running around the house. Nobody heard or saw anything. Um, it freaked everybody out, caused me all kinds of problems, a lot of stress in the household. Um, but one thing did happen that's amazing is this phrase, worldwide telescope, worldwide telescope, worldwide telescope. It was burning in my brain over and over and over again, thousands of times. I went to the computer and I typed in worldwide telescope on excite.com. I never forget this because excite was a search engine like yeah. Google, but back then yes. they had <laughs> Alta Vista, you had excite, yeah. you had, yeah. So I go to excite.com. That was the one I liked back then. So I typed in um, uh, worldwide telescope. And the first search were the first search link that came up was worldwide telescope.org. And I almost fell out of my chair. I clicked on the link. At that time, you had to install the software to access it. Now you can install the software or you can use HTML5 to, to do it. Yeah. I installed it. I executed it. I ran the software program and it opened up. It was access to the space probe data from all the missions ever sent into space. And wow. it was from the perspective of the probes. It was a probe data. 
It was incredible. Um, and all the Hubble telescope data as well was all combined into this thing. It was like the ultimate Google Sky, you know, type yeah. of software program back then. And the first thing I saw was Mars. And then I saw Mars panoramas. I said, okay. Then I saw rovers, Opportunity Spirit. I'm like, okay, uh, let me click on it. Click on uh, Viking. I clicked on Opportunity, I believe, went in there first. And I started looking around. Unless you look from the actual mass cam of the actual rover, and you can zoom in, zoom out, pan left and right. It was incredible. And I started seeing things on the ground that didn't look like they belonged on Mars. And I'm going, wow, this looks like dilapidated structures. It's like broken statues. Some of the things I saw resembled things from the ancient Egyptian civilization, some things from Peru. And I said, wait a minute, whoa, how can this be there? And we have these same types of things here. And that's how I dug deeper into the ancient civilizations. I was already just researching mainstream ancient mm. civilizations because it, it, it was exciting to me. But I didn't go deep into the connections. Now that took me down a whole new rabbit hole into ancient civilizations beyond what I had been researching before and then making the connections and ties between advanced technology and ancient civilizations. Uh, and that's how I really got deep, deep into all of this. So let's let's stay on that particular point because I've seen the the, the footage and the, the imagery and stuff of the 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 pyramidal structures on Mars and stuff yeah. and faces and stuff like yeah. what's the, what's the explanation? Well, if you look into research? these yeah, if you look into these ancient Sumerian cuneiform tablets, it's called the there's a few of them. One's called the Enuma Elish and the mm -hmm. Seven Tablets of Creation. Mm -hmm. And the other tablet is called the Atrahasis, the Epic of Atrahasis. And so these tablets tell an incredible story that date back tens of thousands of years uh, about these beings that arrived here into our solar system from another planet, that they came to not just Earth, but they came to Earth, our moon, Mars, and moons of Saturn and Jupiter to create a breakaway civilization and mine this area, this sector of the galaxy for resources. Uh, and Earth was just one of them, and so was, uh, so was Mars. And it talks about the fact that there was a group of these beings, and the tablets call them the IGG, I-G, I-G, or uh, yeah, I-G-I, I-G-I. And so these beings, um, they weren't slaves, but they were forced to continue to work on Mars, even under its harsh conditions. And they built a civilization there, and they were mining resources on Mars. Now, so that told me something, that, that there were two concurrent civilizations, one on Earth and one on Mars, running at the same time. The one on Earth, they had um, the humans living in a slightly set back technologically era than the ones that were up on, the people that were up on Mars. And, uh, and then it come to a point where these people on Mars decided they wanted to have a coup against the rulers of Earth. This is, really, and, and the rulers of Earth were a new, Enki and Enlil, Anu was the godhead of these pantheon of beings Indeed. that came here, according to the tablets. This yeah. is where you see in the Bible that, uh, you know, the, the sons of God, which were the Gigi, fell from heaven. They came from Mars down to earth and uh, they rebelled against God. That's all in the Bible. That's a true fact, but it's really coming out of the Enuma Elish and the Epic of Atrahasis. Uh, and it even talks about the fact that once they decided to overt the first war, which which they ended up having one anyway, but they averted the first one by genetically modifying the existing people that were on this planet, us, our cousins, before they were homo sapien. They genetically modified us to turn us into worker slaves to do the work for them. And then the EGG, before they departed, said, we're going to take some of these women too, because you ain't give us no women. <laughs> so <laughs> this is in the tablets. So they, this is where the, the, the sons of God made it with the daughters of men and gave birth to the Nephilim. That's all in the Bible as well, but that's how that whole thing started. This is all in ancient tablets that predate the Bible by tens of thousands of years. Uh, and, you know, and so these beings were up there and they had created a civilization extremely similar to the same ones we see here on Earth. Our, we've got Ankhs up there. There's statues that resemble Egyptian type statues. There's hieroglyphs. There's uh, we found sarcophagi. We all the stuff is up there on Mars, just like it is here on Earth. Of course, pyramids and temples and everything else. And is it's this all, all up there? Is this all down to synch synchronism? What? Mm -hmm. How we have those? Obviously, two different planets and two different peoples of sorts on there, creating yeah. the same type of of structures and stuff. 
Well, it will all come from one master architect. You know, if you look back into some of the texts, for example, Thoth, the Atlantean priest king who ruled over the land of Kem before it was called Egypt, pre dynastic era for 14,000 years, he handed down a whole script of these architectural guidelines to everyone, all his people, to mm -hmm. go duplicate these building of these structures in different places. Uh, so <clears throat> in essence, so that's the blueprint. The blueprint was given out, and it's just right yeah. it's just the same as we can say reference the um the flood the flood epic we can see that mm -hmm. in multiple um ancient manuscripts across the, the, the this plane of existence yeah um, exactly. all saying different slightly different variations but ultimately mm -hmm. saying that there was a flood um that mm -hmm. wiped out you know the majority of the populi apart from a certain sector people right mm -hmm. right same exact story same exact story in Thoth's emerald tablets that he left behind a 36,000 year old text. It starts off that the flood waters finally started to recede and the ancient temples were coming up out of the mud. And so he goes back to the land of Kem to bring them back up, up to a high level of civilization, which means they had already achieved a high level at one time mm. in the past. So what was the, what was the fall then? What, what, do you, what do you contribute to the fall? Why, as we can see, like today, we cannot replicate the buildings, the structures, and you know, we cannot move the the, the stonework, etc. What mm -hmm. what was the fall? What happened to yeah. the you know what caused the fall of civilization? Well, these people were the ancient Atlantean people. These Anunnaki. Anunnaki is a general term for people who come from space to Earth. It could be from anywhere in space, any planet, any any galaxy. No matter where they come from, the Earth they're Anunnaki. But the specific race of people that went to war on this planet were called the Atlanteans. These Atlantean people were highly technological. Uh, and then at some point they decided to start battling with one another. A lot of these attacks and these wars made it into the Bible under the book of Deuteronomy. You can read the book of Deuteronomy. You'll see these attacks, which appear to be ordered by God, singular. But when you translate the text, you find out that it's actually God's plural. And that these gods aren't even the creator of the universe, that they're actually people giving orders uh, to regular humans to go fight and battle for, um, you know, resources and control of other humans in other areas on the planet. Uh, and so uh, these wars persisted. There's also a great war that occurred, two pyramid wars, and they were all started by Amun-Ra, who was also one of these Anunnaki Atlantean people. Uh, in the Bible, his name is Marduk. Marduk He's also yeah. known as Marduk in the Torah. Uh, and in the, in, in the Sumerian cuneiform tablets, in a newer version stone that's only about 5,000 years old, he's known as Marduk, uh, but his name is Amun-Ra. If you go into the older, um, the older versions, and then it goes all the way back to where then the person, the name has been called Nibiru. It's a weird uh, thing, but got a whole timeline on it. But anyway, yeah. this guy wanted to take kingship of the planet Earth ahead of his appointed reign. They used to reign the planet based on the procession of the equinox, and his was Pisces. He wanted to take over a whole thousand years before Pisces really started. And to do this, he created a war on Earth. Okay, that's one. Then the second time he was ruling and, and, and everything else, he's ruling so brutally and, and trying to take over so many other regions of the planet, which were, which were being run by his relatives, so to speak, uh, and creating so many wars. Uh, they ended up trying to assassinate him and he ended up fleeing back to his skyship. Uh, but he left kingship of his finances and the kingdom to his Ra Kam, K-A-M, and Ra Kam translates into Ra Shield. And if you really understand the how, how languages kind of merge over time, uh, he left 5,000 years ago, he left the kingship, the rulership, and the finances of this planet to the Ra Shields, which is why they're- Rothschilds, exactly. <laughs> you got it, you got it. I so the Rothschilds are worth $700 trillion right now. Yeah, yeah okay. All right. Yeah. So this is all from ancient text. <laughs> and, and and if we go to we go to Asia to the uh, the, the Vedic texts and stuff, you, they, 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 and the the imagery that they're, they're, they're talking about nuclear wars taking place, flying machines, flying saucers, yeah. all that. Oh yeah. Is, yeah they is, all have they have these huge wars, cities fighting against cities in space mm. that the human beings would witness from below. Yeah. Cities crashing on top of them, coming from the sky, land. Those are giant UFOs, of course. Uh, there was a huge battle here. This battle extended from Earth 
to the moon and even all the way to Mars. That's why Mars was the god of war. They ended up getting in that big war that, that they wanted to avoid the first time. It ended, ended up happening. Uh, and so Mars was destroyed by nuclear uh, weapons, which the evidence of that is well known. If you look at the Brandenburg documents, uh, the science data from Mars shows that there's an, there's an enormous amount of xenon in the atmosphere and in the soil. This is now peer reviewed science. And it's not just any regular xenon, it's weapons grade xenon, which is only uh, a waste product of nuclear fallout. <laughs> <laughs> so the evidence of the nuclear war is there. Now I've got to I've I've got to push back a little bit of sorts mm -hmm. because you will have people that say, okay, it's all fine, and we've got scientists that say this, and we've got scientists, and we've got so-called NASA never a straight answer who are allegedly sending probes up to bloody the to Mars and all of these places and stuff, but yet we've got homeless people and blah blah blah, which is another side side issue. But ultimately, the the crux of the matter is that there are a, a percentage of the populi who don't believe number one that we went to the moon, number mm -hmm. two. Which I I'm kind of in that 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 respect. I don't think any man has left his plane of existence and gone on to another, you know, in this realm of, of living that we're in now, this te right. technological age. But in regards to the probes and stuff and sending beaming the information back, I, I, you know, I'm kind of still like, okay, we're advanced. Is it really possible? Have they really got the technology to send a probe up to Mars and then like years oh, later? It. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they, they, they've got it. See, first and foremost, I did a huge paper, uh, which is published. It's on the paper's document. It's called, Yes, We Went to the Moon, and Yes, We Lied About It. And so I give both sides of the coin in that document. It's a, it's a huge blog. It went viral for a very, very long time. And I give, it's about a 15 to 20 minute read. It's pretty extensive and pretty mm. detailed. But it goes into the fact of, it goes in, into everything, including the Van Allen radiation belt. Yes. Which... Uh, Van Allen, it does exist. However, Van Allen, during the Mercury missions, uh, was concerned about it. Then the military and NASA said, well, let's, let's take a look at this thing. They sent up a, uh, a low Earth orbiting probe to check it out. Oh, yeah, there is radiation there. And so then what they said was to them, you know, they said, well, what if we launch a nuke and blow it up in the upper atmosphere? Ugh. Which they did, believe they it or did. not. It was yeah, 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 I heard about and, that. Yeah, yeah. And that added more radiation, uh, you know, to the belt. And then uh, when we got a much higher orbiting satellite, they were able to discover something very interesting that this Van Allen radiation belt did have radiation, but not enough to kill a person unless they were inside of an unprotected capsule for about four months. And to get through it, it only take three days to get through it. Then they found out something else astounding, which the flight path is available to the general public. Because of the way the Earth's magnetic field whips out of the planet, it creates these openings, these yes. space highways, so to speak, these gaps where the radiation belt is actually caught up in the magnetic winds, so to speak, and there's these openings. And so the flight path is very well plotted and well known on the path and the course to get through uh, a very thin portion of the van and radiation, radiation belt in only three days, which, can, which has zero effect on the human body. The second thing is... Um, the famous space boots that you see the smooth bottom and then you don't, yeah. and there's a, but there's boot print. Yeah. Well, that's a cropped image that's been put on and floating around the internet. I have the original image in my blog on forbiddenknowledge.com. You can go check it out. Uh, I've been there to the actual, uh, you know, museum where they have the suit and the one that's in the famous picture. What they've cropped out is on the side or is something called the overshoe. And in my blog, and not only do I have the overshoe, I have an x-ray scan of the overshoe, and I have an actual astronaut putting the overshoe on, slipping that very slim, uh, that very uh, smooth bottom into the overshoe. You don't wear 20 pound overshoes inside of a small capsule. You put those on only when you are getting ready to put to, to do a moonwalk. It's designed to keep you on the surface. Yeah, zero gravity. And and things like, yeah, exactly. So I have the picture, the original picture, where you can see where the other one's cropped. This one actually has a full image. The other reason why they did this moon mission and lied about it was because when they sent a low moon, or moon orbital uh, uh, satellite up to just check out the moon, they found a lot of incredible anomalies and structures, some standing, some dilapidated, some in good condition, and a bunch of stuff scattered all over the, the, the surface 
in different areas that look technological. And so the mission really was a recognizance mission. It was to go gather these things and some of this stuff and bring it back so they can analyze what in the hell happened, what's up there, and can they reverse engineer any of this stuff? But to the general public, it's all was kept hush hush top secret. We're going to show them a barren landscape, nothing up here but what looks like you know silver sand. Uh, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, what they were doing was really collecting data, is what they were doing, collecting data, collecting samples. Um, there's an interesting black box audio, which I was able to get Freedom of Information Act. And that black box audio is in one of the documentaries that I'm in. Uh, it was called, uh, I think it's Uphobia, Doc Uphobia, Doc Uphobia is how it's spelled with a capital UFO. But in the documentary, we play the black box audio. And the black box audio, it's, uh, you hear one of the astronauts saying, look at those conical structures down there. And you, you hear Neil say, I bet the people down there never get out, leading or alluding to the fact that they thought that people might be living down in some of these, uh, these domes, uh, structures that, were, that, that they were looking at on the surface of the moon, which I do believe is potentially uh, could be life. And we found that the moon was hollow. So there's a lot going on there, you know, and, and uh, obviously none of us, neither you or me can actually go directly to the moon and verify this with our own eyes and hands yeah. and everything else. So it's a lot of speculation. However, it's circumstantial evidence. Once I start putting, putting together science data and, uh, and radar data of the moon, and you can see how it's through the ground penetrating radar, how it's hollow inside, and it just appears to be what steel beams are in there. And then you start analyzing some of the, you know, some of the other data that's come back with anomaly images on them from untouched image, image uh, photos from, from NASA before CGI, before Photoshop. All of a sudden, you, you, you know, you have to say there's enough circumstantial evidence to at least put a question mark as to something has gone on. And I think that it's a top secret mission uh, to gather intel, gather data, and potentially find technology that nobody would want to share with the world. Because if I found technology and I was a, co a country bent on global domination i would keep everything quiet and a secret and i would tell people a totally separate story most definitely most definitely and it doesn't surprise me we've seen it in the bun movies we've seen it in the sci-fi movies this is is art and reality and life they're they're they're, they're best friends you, yeah, you, that's it's, all it is. You, it's hard yeah. to separate i mean okay then on um, dark side of the moon mm -hmm. dark side so the dark side of the moon there was a mission Called the Clementine mission. Mm -hmm. Now, when I heard, when I learned about this mission, I knew right away that there was something going to be suspicious happening because Clementine is a song, an old Western song here from the U.S., where it says, "Clementine, oh my darling Clementine, you were lost and gone forever, oh my darling Clementine." So once I saw that it was a top secret mission by the military and it was named Clementine, I said to myself, "Oh boy, we got something here. I got to check this out." So the declassified documents come out, all the declassified images came out from Clementine and sure enough, Clementine never came back. In other words, they lost, they claimed that they lost the satellite on the dark side of the moon. It did a low lunar orbit. So it wasn't as high as it normally would be. It was very low, mm -hmm. almost to the surface, but not quite. When it went around the dark side of the moon, it ran into something and it stopped there. It hit it and it crashed on the surface, but it transmitted back an enormous amount of high quality high megabit images which show clear anomalies uh there's also some uh again declassified documents and declassified black box audio of the actual astronauts of apollo 10 before 11 mm -hmm. when they orbited the moon without landing when they got to the dark side you you actually leave what they call you know uh comms range you're out of comms yes. range for about yes. you know 30 minutes well while they were out of comms range they got their comms got hacked into and they were listening to something coming from what they claim was the moon's dark side surface huh? it sounded like music and these guys were freaking out the audio was available to the general public they were literally freaking out you i can't tell it's in my ears too i can hear it too oh my god what it's music I can't. they were freaking out and then when they came around and they got back in comms range uh that cut out in the in, in houston cut back in again to their comms you know, so that was pretty interesting. So there's a lot going on. If the, in the ancient Sumerian tablets, they talk about building a base on the moon and that it was a great place for them to uh, have a way station before launching off to rendezvous with one of their home planets. So it's very possible uh, that there could be something up there or at least 
remnants of something up there from ancient times. Uh, okay, all right then. So if, since we've gone down that rabbit hole, Antarctica. Oh, and Antarctica. Who? And the ice wall. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know about the ice wall, but I do know that there's a huge pyramid in Antarctica. I mean, massive. The pyramid in Antarctica is larger than the Great Pyramid at Giza in Africa. And now probably almost twice as large, actually. And what's interesting about the pyramid in Antarctica is that it still has this apex. The peak is still on top. Yes. And some former military uh, have said that when they worked in that region, that it still was emitting some type of exotic energy that they can't really understand it. But there's still energy coming from the top of that pyramid. Now, there is a research center right next down the valley away from that pyramid next to this huge 35 meter opening in Antarctica, where you have all you have these research bases from all the major continents on the planet Earth. Uh -huh. And there is, it's a no war zone. You can't fight there. You can't attack anybody there. You're all researching something incredible, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and you can see these bases, these research facilities from Google Earth. You can uh -huh. see them. They're labeled as well. Who owns which exactly. base? Exactly. Germany, yeah. UK, Russia. Uh, okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And there's even one, which is the Rockefeller Foundation, where Rothschild and Rockefeller own that one together, mm -hmm. uh, which is bizarre because they're not a country. <laughs> <laughs> but they own a part of Antarctica. They bought that. They bought a piece. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. Now, if you go back to the, you know, the, the, the Nazi era, where Hitler was ordering his, his Nazis to go around the world and, and search and track down ancient technology, they even went to Tibet. Yes. They went everywhere. And they ended up in Antarctica, where they, according to them, met these pre-Adamite people that taught them how to build these Hanabu craft. And, um, you know, we ended up going under to see what the hell was going on. And some of our marine ships got attacked by these craft and destroyed and sent us back home packing, you know, with our tail between our legs. So they had developed something down there uh, that had the capability of maneuvering and, and doing things that we had never seen before. Admiral Byrd said... We face a new enemy, one that can fly from pole to pole in ex with extreme speed. Uh, and he was horrified by this. He was the one who led the mission to go to Antarctica to find out what the Nazis were doing down there. You know, so Antarctica is, a, is an incredible place. I think there could be potential in advanced civilization somewhere underneath that ice still surviving till this very day. Um, and if some of the new animals that have been discovered melting from the global uh, warming, they they have undigested food in their stomach. Some of them still have the food they were chewing on in their teeth. So, you know, it didn't even rot yet. So it tells us that Antarctica was in a different position and it slid into that spot where it's at right now very rapidly, leading up to a hypothesis of a pole shift of the crust of the earth, you know, at some point in the distant past, where the crust slipped, two tectonic plates slipped and allowed a big land mass to shift very rapidly into a new position, flat, a flash freezing uh, everyone there in an entire advanced civilization is frozen, I believe, underneath that ice, which is why we're down there investigating it. Mm. Which kind of ties in of sorts with the uh, the barren ice straits of sorts, that 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 um, bridge that allowed the um, the Mongolians, etc., to cross over to the to mm. Canada then to Central America, etc. Yeah, yeah. You know, all that stuff was uh, at one point was a giant ice sheet, you know, about 13,000 years ago. Mm. You know, about 12,000 years ago, everything started to melt and yep. uh, continental drift a little, helped a little bit and, you know, created this a little bit more of the separation that we see today. Definitely. Um, as we wind this build down, uh, really, let's go into the age old question, chicken or the egg? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some people hypothesize um, yeah, that the original man is, you know, uh, and the mother and father of civilization are black people. Mm -hmm. Where is your research sort of brought you and where would the cradle of civilization be brought forth? We can see from old science of sorts um that we have bones that are coming out of um south africa we've got some nubia we have some um iraq we have mesopotamia um like 
where do where do we see your what well, based upon your research the uh, the cradle of civilization is and who are, who were those people? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So initially, um, I was going with you know the mainstream discoveries. Oh, it's all you know out of Africa and it's all out of these areas that you just mentioned. However, it goes a little bit deeper than that. And so when I went to Australia and sat with the Aboriginal people, the Aboriginal elders, they have a uh, tens of thousands of years of handed down verbal history that goes from elder to elder. And it's the same story uh, that I found in ancient texts from all around the world. And it's that people were brought to this planet. Now, the Aboriginal story is that they were the first people, and these are Black people, they were the first people brought and seated on this planet by other Black people. And they were seated on this planet by these other Black people. They came from a region of space called the Pleiades, from a place called the Pleiadian Star Cluster. Mm -hmm. They're known in the Iliad, uh, Homer's Iliad and the Bible as the Seven Sisters, in the Greek as the Seven Sisters. And if you go into the ancient Sumerian tablets, you'll see as well that they, that they knew that there were eight star, eight big bright stars there, but one died as it ran out of fuel. So they even have this documented as what it originally looked like from the vision on earth uh, before one star ran out of fuel, which is pretty interesting because I didn't learn that until after my encounter with the Aboriginal people. And so as I dug deeper into some other texts, I started finding that it appears that black people uh, don't originate from earth at all. And that even other races of people don't originate from earth, but that our relatives, so to speak, were brought, brought people here, seated a breakaway civilization on this planet to preserve life, to preserve the race. There was a galactic war in many texts now, all leading back to the Pleiadian star system. And in this war, uh, planets were fighting against planets. It was a planetary war. Debris was going everywhere. There was a weapon used called the Brahmada and the Brahma, and it would destroy planets. It was a planetary destroyer, like a Death Star in Star Wars. That's probably where they got this story. And that, imagine a chunk of another planet crashing into your planet. People who could escape, escape. Just like you have Ukrainian refugees and so forth and Syrian refugees, well, they were space refugees from the Pleiades and they spread out all around the, uh, the Milky Way. A lot came into this sector of the uh, galaxy. A lot went to the, you know, to the, the Sirius A, B, and C before B was the dead star. They used to live there as well. Uh, you had Aldebaran, uh, Orion, uh, and just many other star systems that are out there right now, and Alpha Centauri, yep. and then, of course, uh, right here with our own sun and this solar system as well. And so it's a pretty interesting story, and what it really tied into for me was the fact that a lot of these, you know, quote-unquote, UFO sightings may not be little green men with antenna, but they could just be people that look just like you and I, uh, and they could be related to us in some way. So, in essence, would they? Would it just be physiologically these distant cousins or relatives, however we want to sort of dub them, they would physiologically look like us, or would there be any physiological difference? They look just like us, except for in some accounts their heads were bigger. Uh, in some accounts, the heads weren't bigger. In some accounts, they were taller and stronger, and in some accounts, they were smaller. So it was a varying array of different sizes, yeah. shapes, but mm -hmm. overall the same hominid, yeah. homo sapien type of a look. Yeah. Uh, they would dwell amongst people in different areas and regions, and they, they, they got along. And in some cases, they even made it with humans and then that had birth and gave birth. So it means a compatibility was there. You know, so it's uh, one of them told me that Earth was an abandoned seed colony. You know, so I think our origins go far beyond Africa and Sumeria and Mesopotamia. I think our origins, for, especially for Black people, go way out into a totally different planet. Hence the term star seeds. Yes, star <laughs> seeds. Right. And for the indigenous Native American star brothers, and you could just go around the planet and you'll find every every culture that they're saying, these are our people. These are, you know, we're not from here. You know, even if you look at the circadian rhythm of the human being, the, the, the sleep and wake cycle of the human is yeah. not tied to Earth's rhythm. They found that even the circadian rhythm of a, of a, of a human being is better suited for Mars on spinning on its axis than it is for Earth. So our circadian rhythm even, isn't even from this planet, doesn't tie to this planet. That's 
Very interesting, man. Yeah. So do you think, hy- hypothesizing, if, if Mars could um, allow us to inhabit it, do you mm-hmm. think our mental and physical capabilities would be enhanced? Oh, well, right now, in this generation of us living and being born on Earth for these many generations, our bone structure is so dense, dense. It's set to Earth's gravity. Yeah, yeah. And if we went to Mars right now, we would be supermen, you know? And this leads back to some of the ancient stories of these beings coming to Earth and being looked at as supermen. They can lift heavy things. They can throw boulders and all this mm. crazy stuff. They were probably from a planet that was much larger than Earth. So their bone density was even stronger than ours. If we go to Mars, we can, I would be able to slam dunk a 20-foot basketball hoop, you know? <laughs> leap over, leap to the top of a small building. Yeah. pick up a small car and throw it all these kind of we would appear to be superheroes over there you know but right now and then if we had birth if we gave birth to a baby on mars that first generation would be kind of strong but mm. not as strong as us and if they then had another generation of baby born after them that baby would be completely a martian and under a Mar- uh, born you know on completely you know the dna would be a completely um developed under martian gravity and they would be much weaker but they'd be much spindly and much taller, probably. Do you think that that leads to some of the ways that these, some of these huge stones were put into place for some of these ancient sort of me- megalithic sites? I believe so. I mean, some of this had to do with strong people. Of course, I think that some, some things used ancient you know, advanced technology and techniques, but I think some of the work was done by people that were just incredibly strong, <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know? And if you look at history of Earth, there were times when there were huge mammals on this planet, the saber-toothed tigers and the gigantic sloths and all these, mm. these creatures that weren't dinosaurs, but were massive. These massive spiders and massive sharks and all these things that have been found. We found the bones. And so I do think that, um, you know, for us to not rule out that people could have been massive, I don't think it's a far stretch. I think people were massive and I think they were very strong and could have moved, easily moved a lot of these big objects around. Well, it's either that or it, it's um, you know, telekinesis sort of telep- telepathy, that kind of thing. Possible. Or, yeah, yeah, that's possible too. You know, in the Emerald Tavis, Thoth says he learned the capability of manifesting stone through conscious thought and light. And so he would combine the two together to create solid bricks. You know, so there's all kind of ways things could have been done. Alchemy. T- uh, Toph, that, that's uh, Tahuti, right? Yeah, Tahuti, right, correct. Yes. Okay. Same, same person. Yeah. Um, Hermitian and then the, what, the Grecian tongue for it, right? Toss. Hermes, Hermes, yeah. Hermes Trismegistus. Yeah. Both is uh, also Hermes, you know, you know, Greek, uh, you know, terminology. Um, he's known as one of the Natiru in Africa. You know, he, one of the great Natiru that came was a group of pantheon of them that came here. And according to the Egyptian Book of the Dead, they turned mud into a kingdom. Just what, what era and what part of Africa are we talking? East or West? We're talking in the Egyptian era, area in the land of Kim. Ah, That's I where can. they started out. They started there first. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Um, two last questions for you, sir. Firstly, have you had fun today? Oh, man. Listen, this is great. This is great. It's always good to talk with an intellectual like yourself, man, you know, and it's great that we can have opposing opinions on things, but have a great conversation and because it teaches people that you can talk to somebody and have opposing opinions and still have a, and have an educational debate or a, a conversation that doesn't lead to, to arguments and, 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 and attacks. It can, be, it can be well sought after information on both sides. That's what it's about. It's all about the discourse. A discourse or a debate is absolutely fine. An argument shows lack of integrity, lack of right. emotion control, and lack of respect for you and yes. the person you're speaking to. Yes, man. Thank you. So thank you. I appreciate you for that, man. Thank you. Honours. Honours. Um, last one for you. Please tell us who you are, sir, but do not tell us your name. Okay. Well, what I am is a space traveler and a time traveler. And what I mean by that is I'm on a planet that moves through space, in my opinion. And how I travel through time is I create ripples in the space-time continuum that alter future realities in the third dimension. Love it. 
that was quick. I like the way you 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 you, for, you formulated that latter part. That was excellent, sibling. Um, please throw out all your social medias, your websites, and as I say, I'll make sure I put the links below in the description. Okay. Well, you can follow me at Four Bidding Knowledge with the number four on all social media platforms. Four B I D D E N K N O W L E D G E, and you can also go to my website fourbiddingknowledge.com. Excellence. Please make sure you go over and check out um, Billy's website. Um, if this is the first time you've come across a brother, I'm pretty sure you haven't. But if this is the first time you have, there's it a plethora of content available. Support, like, comment, subscribe, share, tell a friend to tell a friend, to tell a brethren, to tell a sister to jump on the train. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, man. Honest, honest.